Excited to have UK indie royalty on our synth with oh. us. Uh, <laughs> um, Sarah Blackwood and Chris Wilkie of, of Dubstar. Um, congratulations on your fifth album release. Fifth album release, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, fifth, fifth, um, yeah, fifth normal album. Yeah. I saw recently you um, you described it as your best work. Um, and with no disrespect to your amazing back catalogue, um, 
I agree. I think it's a brilliant album. Um, really enjoyed, uh, really enjoyed listening to it. Um, what is it about it that you you love so much? Uh, the, the songs. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I don't not mean to be glib. I mean, I, th I think it, when, when you when you're writing songs and things, you tend to um, always try to push to do your best work you know, in the future, you know, and, and so it's the most recent thing we've done. So we, we feel like we've we've done the strongest thing we could have done. Also, I think that by being a bit older, uh, we've actually, you know, we've obviously sort of got better at what we do over the years. Um, I, th I, th I think if it, if it, if it wasn't going to be the best thing that we thought we'd done, we probably would have put it on a back burner and waited a bit until it was, you know, it's, I mean, mm -hmm. it seems obvious, you know, but um we're at a stage now where we don't have a label breathing down our necks and you've got to have a product on the 6th of June. You know, it's so we can wait until we think that it's the best thing. So at that point, um, you know, when it came out, that's the, you know, we feel like that's that's the, what we want to say. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, and I get the impression uh, a lot of this was written in lockdown. Am I, am I correct? Was was produced in, in lockdown? Yeah, I mean a lot of it. I mean the the majority, well at least half was was written before the beginning of that. But um, we had we had loads of songs. I mean we usually try to go into a new album project with around about twenty to thirty songs if you can. It's because you you you're always going to end up triaging some out and and, and focusing on the ones which de deserve the most attention. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you have to actually have started the process before you realise what it needs. Um, and what's missing like you, you start to get a picture of what kind of record you're making and then you think well what what it would take to make this album really great now is something like this and then you you, you it gives you ideas that you wouldn't have had when you were just throwing things and hoping they stick um so so that's why a lot of the writing started to happen uh, you know also the, the the experience of you know that we all had certainly made you it affects the mood of the work you're doing so uh, consequently the raw materials need to start to inform that as well um it, it, it wasn't a deliberate sort of uh, contrived thing it was really just it, it felt like the right thing to do um and your um sort of recording producing remotely uh, sarah I, I noticed uh, you were you, you mentioned a few things about recording vocals while doing renovations and all that kind of stuff. I had just, just give us some floor at one point. <laughs> it's like, oh, wow, that must be so challenging. <laughs> it was really, well, well no, I, I, I'm, I'm being dramatic, but there was like a, a, a significant amount of like the floor missing and I was doing like vocals and looking down the kitchen below. It was a bit alarming. So, yes, I think, I think that was another thing why I love the album so much as well, because it was like a sort of felt like a triumph in the face of adversity. And I always like things like that. Um, what are your remote recording tips? We have lots of artists that listen to uh, or watch watch along on 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 Absinthe who do all sorts of amazing things uh, with remote recording across continents. Uh, you know, lots of time differences. What 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 tips have you got for us for, for making it work? <laughs> do you know? I would I would be inclined to give the same advice as Priscilla Presley gave me when I was having my first child. <laughs> she said, oh, you, you, no, I'm not joking. Uh, you need to have uh, love and patience. <laughs> right. Especially, especially the, the, if you can get the patience right, you know, everything else will take care of it because it just, it takes much longer. You know, it's, you don't have the immediacy of looking into each other's eyes when you're actually performing as much um, or when you just, when you're throwing out ideas and sometimes you you know people are telling you that it's all right but you don't really know if they really think it's okay and um, yeah yeah especially when you yeah 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 it's, it's, it, well you, you have to just be ready to wait um so right t t i mean for instance you know it, it was frustration frustrating i know for sarah because sometimes she'd have to wait for ages um whilst i was tinkering or was even Haig was tinkering just in order to, to start doing the bit where she can really sort of get get into it um you know i, I would i would usually finish working about 3 a.m at that stage and um which which is fine um and higgy's pretty good for staying up late so he would he would take over often sarah would get something to yeah, early back <laughs> yeah I don't know when he sleeps 
you know, that's that's the thing. So, um, but it, it but it seemed to work out. So we had a, it was almost like a relay race sometimes. Um, so I can imagine if, if if people are needing to do the remote production thing, um, like we certainly did then, <laughs> um, then just be impatient is <laughs> the way to go. And you're you're almost making use of having a a night owl or two on the team that sort of gives you a continual cycle. Or are you all are you all up all night? Oh God, oh, no! no. I, I, I'm neither a morning person nor a, a, a <laughs> night. <person. laughs> you're in the you're in the middle. I'm right in the middle. Yeah. Okay. I'm, oh. I'm like productive from ten till like eight, and then forget it. So. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but but it, the, 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 on the upside though is that um, you you get the benefit of living with something for a little bit longer before you have to go back to it, and it forces you to do that rather than rushing back in. So if you've if you've had an idea which sounded great when you pinged it off at three a.m., you know you've you've literally had a chance to sleep on it, sort of. Well, you know, not literally, but um. And then, you know, sometimes next time when somebody comes back to you, they, they, they'll be saying something like, oh, you know, it, it could have been better if it was a bit like this and you already agree with them because you've had time to think with it. Mm. So it's it's just thinking in a different way. Yeah, interesting. How like, would you... you... Okay, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry, Serena, you carry on. Sorry. Oh, I was going to ask, like, how would you um, compare and contrast the record you know, recording back then, production back then, when you guys worked on your first album versus now, like, you know, with the whole technology that we have, it's like, I because you you guys are, are OGs, like, you know, original gangsters <laughs> from the 90s. And it's like, I always wondered about, like, you know, the processes then versus how would you compare it to, to, to today, so... Well, I think it, it can be quicker. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, Hagee, like he, 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 you know, it was like I say, it was recorded to tape. So if you're doing like comping, you are physically cutting the tape with a <gasps> razor blade and sticking it together. You are literally and Hagee loved that. He loves doing that. <laughs> was yeah, he, it's true. Uh, so I just mean, the uh, first, you know, the first album was on tape. The second one was on hard disk um, on the radar. And then next thing you know, we're in a completely different cities, <laughs> you know, yeah. recording on, 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 you know, home digital stuff. So it's, it is bonkers to think it's the same producer, but we've, the, the way that we've done it has changed dramatically in that 25 years, you know. God, I mean, to remember that studio at Rack, it, Stephen loves Rack Studios and they've got this enormous live room there that's like for, you know, a 24 piece orchestra. Or something. And it's just oh, like wow. me <laughs> stood in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a little microphone booth in the middle of this like huge room, like completely alone, like singing stars over and over and over again. And, you know, and that, that was the first thing we recorded was stars. So I've got sort of quite vivid memories of Stephen going and again and I was like really I have to do it like you know again was it was it not good enough he's like yeah yeah we've got it but you know we'll just do it again just just in case and you know you that was the first time I'd ever sort of come across how many times you you record things before you know you get you get you get your take you know and set, settle for the second one anyway <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> yeah. but I find the second one usually is the best but yeah yeah I mean, that's the thing when you work with Steve and Egg. So, I mean, for those uh, who are tuning in and perhaps not not aware, so the, the producer, Hagee, who uh, Dubs are talking about, is Stephen Haig, who's probably produced some of the greatest pop music of the last 40 years. So we're talking about West End Girls. We're talking about True Faith. We're talking about Kissing For Me. We're talking about A Little Respect. That's the pedigree of this guy. And... Um, I think it's quite amazing that obviously you were you know you were able to work with him for your first album and he's working with you again so um what what do you think is special about your relationship with him that allows him to bring the best out of dubstar Sarah um I mean I can go if you like <laughs> oh, yeah I mean total trust you know just completely trust him yeah I mean it is it, it's the thing is it's funny it's because like you're saying you know it's like when I when we first started uh, d doing this with well with food records and EMI, I, I already you know loved Stephen Haig and you know, and uh, I remember buying uh, for, yeah the, the Please album when I was thirteen and I guess 
1986 and seeing his name on the back and thinking, you know, that guy really must be something else because this is like, I'd heard the singles and this is this like the most exciting sounding record I'd heard for years, you know, even as a kid. And um, so when Andy Ross said to me, you know, have you thought about who you want to produce? Because he had in mind Stephen Higg, I was like, for sure, you know, we're definitely going to do it. So it, it fast forward many years and I mean, we, we've become very close to him and we instinctively understand uh, what he's probably going to ask us to do and uh, and how to please him, if you like. Um, and, and it, But it, it works both ways as well. You know, I mean, it, you know, he usually when he rings me up, um, he doesn't say hi, he usually starts singing a song. Um, <laughs> and it's usually like an old 1950s or 60s tune um, or something and then he's challenging me to join in. Uh, <laughs> like, and I usually... Do it's like a little game we've got, you know, but uh, yeah, he's just a fascinating person. Um, and I, I would have really hated to have had to do our lockdown record for one of a better term with anybody else because it, it really helped. Um, when it was somebody who's going to be on the phone that you can't see, if it's somebody who you have a, a kind of an instinctive feeling with, um, and have known really well for a long time. I, think, I saw. I think... Sorry, Jake. Go on. <laughs> now, I, I saw you mentioned he's the king of restraint um, in in one of your uh, one of your interviews, and I just looking at as as uh, Chi says, I mean, some of the artists he's worked for, I'd say, are highly unrestrained artists. <laughs> what what yeah. is what yeah, does he so do that makes that work? He's the only man who can make timpani sound not bombastic. Right, he can make it sound calm and come in like with this. You know, and, and it can it can make strings not sound too. I don't know, over the top. He just has this way of just making things understated, and uh, but but he just finds that balance where you want to hear more, but it's just perfect. It's just mm. perfect. It kind of leaves you wanting. Oh oh oh! If I listen, I, I, and you want to listen again and again and again, and he kind of has has that. Um, Yes. Um, go on, go on, Chi. I interrupted you there. Oh, I mean, he, he, I mean, he's he's very musical. And I thought it was interesting, Chris, that you mentioned he'd sing some 1950s songs here, and that in a way reflects you and Sarah's um, taste. Because um, looking at the covers you've done together, whether as as, as dubstep or in projects that you, you you've been involved together, there is varied. As on the one hand, you've got your your Gary Newman, your Pet Shop Boys covers, and then the Smiths mm. and New Order. And then in between, you've got the Passions and Billy Bragg. And then right over there, you've got Astrid Gilberto and Charles Aznavour. And I think that's, that that's what, what you know, it, it, that some of those are influences that a lot of pop groups won't indulge in or talk about. And especially also groups that perhaps use electronics as well. It's sort of, you know, it, it's such a diverse palette that, um, mm. that you're influenced by, I think. Yeah, and, and, and that's, I think that's, that helps. It, it really does, and that's that's another thing about about Hagee is that, like, you know, if you are sat up at three o'clock in the morning with him, and then you sort of stuck and you start ch chatting, you, we can we'll end up like talking about like Stephen Stills and, and stuff like that, Todd Rundgren, which you wouldn't really expect, but it's just it's stuff that you know we're not really known for, you know, extolling those kind of things, but. But but we, we, me, me and him both have, have quite a broad spectrum of uh, influences, you know. Even though we you know we tend to sort of try and do certain types of things when we're expressing ourselves, um, and it's good to have that, you know, to someone like that to talk to at three a.m. Yeah. <laughs> what actually something that I only discovered about him the other day, and I'm a fan, so I you know I've, I've followed his work and everything. Mm. I knew he was in Jules and the Poet Polar. Polar Bears yeah. before um, he became a producer. What I didn't realise was the Jules was Jill Shear. Yeah. Who, and for those who don't know, so he wrote um, All Lopez. Through the Night, which Cindy yeah. Lauper had yeah. a hit with. He also yeah. wrote, wrote If you knew, If She Knew What She If he, She Knew What She Wants for the uh, with the, which the Bangles had a hit with. And also um, uh, um, Alison Moyer had a hit with, oh, I've forgotten the name of the blooming song. It's uh, <laughs> I'll find. I'll, I'll come back to it in a moment. Yeah. But you carry on. <laughs> yeah, but, tra but tra tragically, we almost killed him when we were making the Goodbye album. Because, really? uh, wow. Tell us the story yeah. there. Yeah, we need That's, to hear this story. Yeah. I think. <laughs> no, no. Well, no, we, we were um, we, we were 
doing it in Woodstock in upstate New York where Stephen was living at that point and also so was Jules Shearer of, of the... God, you know, it was like Stella all, Street up there. You, know, you looked you know. out the kitchen window into like, you know, the... Who was it? Todd, Todd Rudgren lived there. Yeah, the, well, the Bearsville was there, and you know, oh, Bob, Bob Dylan's house oh, was the there. Traveling Wilburys were there. You know, I borrowed a, I borrowed a, you know, leave on helm, loaned me a mandolin and stuff like that. It was kind of like a, living in a book. But, we lived but, in Bob Clearmountain <laughs> house. You know, you yeah. open the wardrobe and there's like Rolling Stones gold discs everywhere. It was just like, oh my god, you know. Yeah, but, but we, but we, we'd, we'd, we'd rented this car though because you need a car to get around over there, and and right. you know, we, we weren't really used to the. Uh, you know, all these little country lanes and mm -hmm. we came bounding over this thing and almost killed uh, Jules Shear, you know, from the polar bears who, <laughs> as he was coming up and he, he was upset. But it, I didn't realise it was him until that, that night and then Stephen had taken us down to the, uh, the what was it called, the Tinker Street Cafe and Jules was playing. <laughs> like, I was like, oh, there's that guy who's with the terrified face. Um. <laughs> yeah, the, the song Alison Moy had to hit with was whispering your name. There you go. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah no. Yeah. He's he's written a few good ones. But yes. That's, so that's how. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. But Stephen was uh, when Stephen was in the Polar Bears. He he obviously was keyboard player, but also um, he had a kind of a production role in in that group um, as a member. And I think that you know that's probably how he started moving to other things. And for for instance, um, you know when. Uh, uh, what was it? It was Miles Copeland from IRS Records, you know, the same family as Stuart from the police. Um, he was a big fan of Jules and the Polar Bears. And that is why uh, he asked Stephen to try producing this new band that he'd signed called R.E.M. Um, for the first album. And that, so that's the connection there. And which is, it was a conversation about that. I'd always known about it. I was being frightened to talk to Hagee about it because I assumed that there was bad blood. But it was really not. It just, it was one of those things where it didn't really work out when he did that first record with them. Um, but that's kind of why we ended up doing Perfect Circle on on the two album most recently. Because we were, we just, it came up, we were talking about doing covers and things and, you know, usually it's not something that I'm excited to do is covers, but it's often the fun thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I like yeah, well, but that's the thing. But it, see, the thing is, when you're deciding what to what song to do a cover version of, it's it's kind of the same criteria as deciding which of your own songs to do. It's like it, it's really as simple as what does what sounds best when Sarah's singing it. You know, it's like what what sounds like really cool when Sarah sings it. And so when you're throwing things around, that usually will. <laughs> make you shortlist certain things of your own work as well as uh, no, that's, find out. that's interesting actually so you you think more in those terms than you know i guess what the cover represents or yeah an influence yeah okay that's interesting yeah so very, that's a very pure way to choose a cover it, 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 it kind of is you know i mean i think it, usually when it comes down to what sounds best and what like was yeah. saying what you really want to say you'll usually defer to what sounds best when you're making a, a record you know i think you kind of have to. Um, it's very you know difficult I mean? though because you're trying not to put somebody else's interpretation on the song. Mm. I remember when yeah. we did the Astrid Gilberto one, I had to give you my CD so that I couldn't listen to it, and I just had to kind of remember it because otherwise, because her her vocal style is very plaintive, and that's why I liked her because I thought you know she that. Because I always thought, oh, you know, I'm not a proper singer because, you know, I can't sing like Aretha Franklin or somebody. And then I heard Astrid Gilberto and I thought, oh, OK. So she sings a little bit plaintively, like like the way that I do. Mm. But except she's got this heavily accented and it's really difficult to, like, not do the accent. So I had to, like, give Chris, Chris the CD so that I couldn't listen to it. So that when I went in, the, you know, I, all I had were the words and the music. And then I just sang the words but you, you sound great on that, you know. I love it's singing it. It's a great song to sing. It's wonderful. It's, it's funny. I remember, I mean, just going going back to, I remember seeing this interview with Bob Clearman years ago where um, the guy who was interviewing him was like a real tech head. He was really all into the different gear and modules and stuff. And he was asking him, um, <clears throat> you know, how does he decide what pieces of kit to use when he starts his mix? And I think he was expecting a really technical answer, but... It, 
Bob said, well, it's usually the lyrics, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. and, and like, oh, wow. and, it's, and it's that kind of informs what he gets out of the box, you know, or plugs in, yeah. and it's that you usually have to go back to the simple stuff, I think. Yeah. Um, I, 
I had a listen through uh, today to both one and two kind of Ooh. next to each other, Ooh. just as a bit of comparison. And there's a massive difference in the sound of the records. What what um, what kind of drove that? One feels much more guitar orientated. Um, was that a, a how, how did those two sort of styles come about? Right. Well, <clears throat> right. Well, that, that's a good question. Um, well, first of all, when, when we started doing one, when we Right, right at the beginning when Sarah and I were like really starting to get excited about writing together and, and throwing recordings around together in earnest, um, we, we, uh, we didn't really know what kind of project we were doing or even if it was necessarily going to be a dubstop project. We kind of were thinking, you know, it might even be a, a Sarah solo record or something, but whatever it was, you know, I, I, I tend to go straight to gu guitars because it's the easiest thing for me to do. And... Uh, so I would often be sending Sarah things which were mostly on, on guitar. And then when, when it turned out that um, that youth was gonna <laughs> do the record. Ah uh, yeah. You know, I start you know, you start thinking I started thinking about like uh, Crowded Houses Together Alone album and things like that, you know, and Urban Hems and and you, you know, you start thinking, well, what kind of record do you wanna make with youth? <laughs> you know, and like and that did actually Make it, it, it. I mean, not entirely, because there were certainly things like locked inside, which was very yeah, much all about the, the, the Juno and things like. That. Mm -hmm. So you know, but there was certain feelings that we had. It was just to the where we were at that at that time. And to be fair, when we started doing two, it probably wouldn't have been as electronic a record um, as it as it turned out to be without the pandemic, because when Sarah and I first got together at the end of twenty nineteen. At Christmas, I'd just uh, done Tears, and Sarah just sang Tears mm -hmm. and sent it back to me, and it felt so organic and so you know, like it was breathing. And I remember thinking, "Oh, this is the way that it's going to go. It's going to be more like that, and we'll be more intimate, maybe quieter, maybe just where you can really feel, you can hear the air moving around Sarah and stuff, and, and you know, do. Do you know what I mean? So I think we both. An obsession with Lana Del Rey that summer as well, hadn't we? we were... Yeah, there, there was there, that's right, sort of ambient sort of feelings. So <laughs> it was really the fact that you know when when the lockdown, the first lockdown happened, my kids were at home for, for school. <laughs> my wife was working fr from home, um, and she works for NHS England. And I couldn't really do anything during the day. I couldn't get the guitar out, so I was staying up really late at night with head these headphones on playing keys you know and also mm. feel, feeling kind of um a little bit subdued and trying to break out of that sort of uh repressed sort of feeling feeling that the day had brought so i think that probably meant that the, the ones that the second half of songs from that album feel a lot more electronic and also some of them are a lot more upbeat ironically you know and um, i can see outside is pretty much mm. a you know, a, a pumping tune because um, it, it just felt like it, like the right thing to do at, at two a.m. <laughs> <You know? laughs> With the head, these headphones, on. <laughs> headphones, party in your headphones. Yeah, in the yeah downstairs. <laughs> Try not to wake everybody up. Ironically, <laughs> I noticed that about Token because that's actually fairly joyous, and it almost could be yeah. like, like your your take on the Pet Shop Boys. You know, it's because mm. it's quite sort of. I mean, funny enough, when I heard. Purple Zone, which was just the soft cell track that Pet Shop Boys, uh, yeah. re, you know, redid with. It had that. It's 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 that kind of a song. It's sort of like the the reaction to lockdown type of songs. I mean, was that how it felt to you? Kind of, yeah. Um, it, it, and, but also with with Token, uh, you see, the first thing with that was Stephen was playing the piano part for me. That he'd, he'd he'd already thought was a nice part. So that intro, to give credit where it's due, that was all him. And so that kind of made me think. Uh, you know, when, when you hear that, it sort of it makes you think. Well, what, what would happen next? <laughs> so, and I and I start to imagine how Sarah might sort of come in. So this, I wrote the the song that follows that intro as a reaction to that piano, you know, part which is very strident. And it's it's got this kind of romantic lilt, but it's this defiant sort of, but it's also a little bit wistful, you know. So there's so many feelings in it that like it was just a doddle to start writing um, after I heard him play that. So uh, 
you know that's why he has a writing credit on it and also it's 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 why the song sounds like it does you know i mean um i, I remember doing this the chorus straight away like super quick because i could just immediately hear sarah it's, it's kind of like a it's like an i will survive type thing but maybe you know what i mean in, in, in a more sort of nuanced way in a more sort of 20 mm-hmm. 22 way that's that way yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, actually you- Go ahead. Go ahead, Chi. I was going to oh, ask. Oh, it's, it's <laughs> Serena. Sorry, I'm, I'm hogging this. So. <laughs> okay. No. Um, I actually wanted to ask you, because Jake and I discussed this earlier, so you guys are 90s legends. How would you, and now you're, you know, release, you just release a, a record, like now 2022. What were the biggest, you know, you know, comparison, like, you know, comparisons in terms of like, is it, what were the challenges back then in the 90s in terms of releasing music and how different was it from today? And how would you, yeah, and how would you compare today's, you know, um, music release, like strategies versus back when you guys started? Hmm. These um, are like questions I always wanted to ask because it's like. Yeah. <laughs> Spotify has just like changed. The, the the picture completely i mean you can like do something in your bedroom and then you can upload it to spotify and it can go all over the world in an, you know in, in minutes whereas before you had to like get your deals for like north america and then your licensing mm. deals for the rest of the world and it was just like you know it was a real sort of protracted process whereas now you've got that immediacy have you good. um have you found a new audience do you think in in the 2020s it's just, it's interesting. I mean, I feel like we're still kind of finding some of the old audience. Yeah. You know, because, you know, but, but you, you can <laughs> see that some people that they liked us. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, 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 it entertains me, you know, because, you know, we've been doing this. Uh, how many years have we been doing this uh, most recently? Um, but, like, there'll be somebody who'll come up on, on Twitter and say, oh, my, there's a new Dubstar record? Like, who knew? <laughs> you know, like, but but that's fine, you know, because, you see, back in the, in the day when we were on EMI, um, I mean, when we had a single out, they, they had to—they they literally would send a guy out to, to put the posters up around every major city in the UK, you know. And then, and I would see them at the end of the Tyne Bridge, and, they, and then there would be uh, the distribution issues. There would be the, the, making sure the independent local radio stations were ready to go. I mean, we still do things like that now with, with releases, but we do it from home. You know, mm-hmm. it used to have to be boots on the ground. Um, not yeah. just us, but I mean and the entire operation. I mean, we went all over the UK, you know, we all were Aberdeen to Cornwall, didn't we, on radio tours? It was Yeah. And um so so that to answer your question, you see that that that's the the main difference is it, things are quicker now. I, it, it feels it, it's sometimes because you haven't gone very far, you, you can't really tell if you've done it or not. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah, yeah. <laughs> un- until you start to get feedback and people say they enjoy it, and then you just feel relieved. You know, everything <laughs> like, exists on Twitter these days in, in music, mm. and Facebook, and social media. It's like God, that that's that's really bizarre because you know mm. we we were in a world where. You know, there wasn't, and it was just the music papers. And... Yeah, I'll tell you what, what was quite what would be interesting to ask you, and and I guess um, Zarina and Jake would be interested in this as as well. Your interaction, obviously, with the you know you had the music press dealing with you first time round, and there was more of a pedestal for you as mm. artists, whereas now on social media you are to, to the fan they they are closer to you and actually they will leave you comments and messages and things like that and some of them can be very strange an example would be i mean neil alpha from blamange told me he gets messages like that record of yours it's scratched what you're going to do about it and he's like well, you need to take him back to the your retail i can't yeah, yeah. do anything but they they expect we've, we've had a couple of things like that. Yeah, it was oh, like oh, yeah. delivery wasn't there from from one of our. Yeah, it's normally just because their shop, the, the local shop, sold out of the CD or something. It's like, and I just I can't I can't do anything about that. You know, <laughs> and it's tricky. But what yeah. can you say? But you feel like a, a bad person if you don't at least sort of say, "Well, sorry, mate." You know, do you want mine? <laughs> but, but how do you find dealing with social media? 
generally, I mean, have, are, are you handling it directly yourselves, or are, oh, are yeah. you having representatives, or what's what's the situation? No, no, we, we, no. Yeah. To be fair, we, we've sometimes we've, because we've had so much on, we've had other people sometimes step in, but wherever possible, uh, we we do our own social media bits. Um, certainly, if it's our own, uh, if it's our own respective Twitter or whatever. It's just you know I'm always surprised I don't get asked more questions, you know. But but okay. I think I've, I've I've set my stall out pretty badly because I've been pretty, you know, uh, hes oh, hesitant. <laughs> I've been very hesitant. You know, I'm just I don't put much stuff out there. I I, I do like reacting to things on on Twitter, um, and I like seeing, I like reading other people. The listening party was really good. That was great. Yeah yeah yeah. Well that but that's it. I always. I, I, my problem is I tend to assume that nobody wants to you know, wants me to say anything until they ask me directly, you know, and then and then I'll usually I'll, I'm always happy to reply when people ask me stuff. But I I, I always feel a bit sort of churlish about something like piping up and randomly telling folks about how I think about whatever I think on Netflix is any good or you know. <laughs> This is not, not really, I'm just not really cut out for the 21st century. No, I'm, I'm, I'm the same. I mean, I, 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 I take photographs and just mainly put photographs of flowers up. <laughs> tell, us, um, uh, tell us a bit about the listening party. So um, for those of, uh, of our um, viewers who may be not familiar, Tim, it's Tim Burgess from the Charlatans, isn't it, that runs the, it uh, is, the, yeah. the, the listening what, party? What a great thing that is. It, it, uh, so I, if I get the process right, uh, it's usually every week or every other week or around big releases, he'll um, focus on one album and usually get the artist on at that time or, um, or a member of the band or a producer to talk about the production of the album, how it worked. But what, what it creates on Twitter is it's effectively like a funnel of super fans whenever I go on it. And as you say, it's very mm. intensive kind of questions about how did this happen? You know, how did this track get written? What happened, you know, what happened in 1995? All of that sort of stuff. Just you've what, be, what you've is- got to, You've got to be really quick as well. It's just like, because the questions just come in at is, you. Like, is that what it's like? It's like a torrent of questions. Okay. And what did you do? Did you sit yeah. there for hours afterwards answering them all or did you try and answer them all the time? How does it work? We just tried to answer them at the time. So. Yeah. And it's, it's yeah, basically a we just try to do it. So you start the album and it's like three, two, one, off you go, you know, and everybody plays the album. And it's, it is literally, you know, you, you go through the, the album track by track and just share anecdotes and people ask questions. And it's just really lovely. I mean, what a lovely thing to come out of lockdown, you know, just that sort of unity and, you know. It, it was much more exciting than I expected, to be honest. Yeah. I thought it was fascinating. You know, yeah, no, but it was. It was. It was lovely. You know, I was by the end of it. I was like, I really felt like I'd done a gig or something. Yeah. <laughs> you know, okay. It, yeah. It's everybody's so in, in the in the moment, and and one of the things that's always frustrated me about it is it doesn't really feel very much in the moment. Often when you, you know, I tend to look at Twitter when I'm going to Lou or something. <laughs> you know, so, but <laughs> so. Yeah, I just can't. I'm, I'm just not one of these people who sort of sits there and looks at their phone every couple of seconds. Mm. So, but to, when you know everybody's in in the zone at the same moment, you know that that's different. It's quite exciting. Yeah, um, I'd love, love to talk to you about writing process. Uh, you mentioned sort of twenty, thirty tracks whittled down to I don't know 10, 10 or twelve. Mm. Um, how does it usually work for you? How where, where do you start and and how does a, a, a dub star track get get made? Oh, crumbs! That's really hard because it's it, it, everyone's a bit different. Um, mm. it, it usually, it's it's uh, it tends to sometimes it's just like a feeling, or, or just uh, you know, a, I'll usually think or like a first line. I tend to write like ones in chronological order for the most part because bear in mind that I usually try to get a, a finished shape of a song before I show it to Sarah, and I'm just trying to impress right. her initially. You know, so so her, her input will come once this thing has got a kind of a shape. Um, so she she'll start to let me know if she thinks it's any good or is you know. um is is Sarah hard to impress, Chris? What would you say the bar is? Um, well, it's it's not some no no she's not no she's not hard to impress. I mean, I mean the thing is she, she, we we've been mates for like decades. You know what I mean? So like. I, I usually have a pretty good idea of what she's going to like. Um, I, sometimes I'll put something in just for a, a laugh because I know they're going to use it, you know. Um, There's but, a few plays hold the lyrics, shall we say. Yeah, nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, 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 but that's great. That's coming back to him. <laughs> so. Yeah. 
that's, that's right. But but it, but I love that. And and often like I can just tell that if if I've got a part where I'm just really not feeling it, then then she's mm-hmm. kind of can swing into into the into the zone and and pick it up um, on some something like on a you know just a line. Where where it's just not happening, but also, what's most importantly, she can often p- figure out what the song's about before I do. So, <laughs> you know, it, but but sometimes it's like the eye of the duck thing, where like it takes the dot inside of the squiggle to, to denote that this is a picture of a duck. She'll think of the thing which defines it, um, where I think, all oh, right, so that's what it's about, and then you, we can kind of finish it then. Right, um, okay. Do you know what I mean? But yeah, it, no. Well, it's because she has to sing it. If she, you know, at the end of the day, she end, she becomes like the song, you know. So yeah. she 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 needs to be feeling it. Mm. Um, and and your wait. So when you receive something from from Chris, Sarah, what what are you typically t- t- kind of typically doing? Are you is it lyrics? Is it melody? What's the what's the, the kind of process there? Oh, I'm always very excited when my inbox pings. So okay. you just. It, Chris will send me something, and it, it's usually sort of almost fully formed, but the lyrics are still need to be, you know, because the th- the thing is, if you've got a first idea, there's no point over egging it, and like if it's not going to work, so he sends it me in a very sort of rough form, and uh, and then I I sing it and see if it's it's worth worth pursuing as it. Mm. So yeah, if, if if I can sing it, if I like it, if we you know. And um, in, in terms of live performance, what does the Dubstar setup look like now in terms of how you're, <laughs> how you're performing live? Um, oh, well, the last time we did it was just we did an acoustic thing. But okay. That's, um, because be, being like essentially a, a duo, it's just that's something we can do like easily straight away mm-hmm. um, it's really nice actually because we haven't done anything acoustically for years and years and years and we just sat in a hotel room and thought uh yeah we just sort of tried it to see if we could and we, we still could so it's nice it's yeah. nice to know that you've still got that connection and that you know i was surprised that we did you know because <laughs> you know it had been a while you know yeah but, uh, i mean yes. about 10 years. yeah, yeah. But it, and it, uh it, do you have more plans in that direction, or are you uh, are you are you feeling much more like a kind of recording recording band rather than uh, than live? We'll see. We'll yeah. see. It's it's tentative steps, you know. After the pandemic and stuff, we're both a bit uh, crowded, you know. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, we, we 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 I think we like the we definitely like the idea of it as long as we can do a great job of it. Um, I, it's funny because I, I did kind of think maybe we should have been at this point just doing more spontaneous acoustic things just because we can or something but i don't know i, I mean i've hardly uh, since since we last did one i haven't really had a chance to sort of sit down with sarah and kind of de- debrief and really think about you know <laughs> how are you doing what do you <laughs> what do you feel like doing? Well, you did another trip. You did another trip. yeah we, oh, we, 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 we do kind of need to hang out a little bit more because i think when we did that last gig it was like the, the our sort of it was like a punctuation mark at the end of what had been a couple of years doing the record. Mm. And there was this sort of feeling of re- relief and, okay, so it's out and we've just met some nice people and played the songs and we just needed to sort of like stop and, and just the two of us maybe have a cup of tea and sort of say, so what do you fancy doing next? You know, because we haven't, we just haven't done that just yet, you know, really. Um, no, we do need to. We need to sit down yeah. and work out how we're going to do it and... Uh... Yeah, because yeah. um, I, like, I like the visual aspect as well. Because like you know, we've got some really nice visuals, and I think it'd be, it'd be good to. Yeah, tell, tell tell me about the visuals. Um, the visuals on tour are spectacular. I've, um, I, I'm sorry, so I haven't yet purchased the vinyl copy, but it looks amazing. Um, <laughs> I know, shame on me. Uh, yeah, just t- tell me about how the the visuals have come about and um, uh, and where, where they've come from. Well, it started with uh, both of us have got quite an obsession with brutalist architecture. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Chris had some pictures of uh, the Gateshead car park uh, that was in the film Get Carter. It was featured. Mm. It had its anniversary around the same time as our album release. Um, 
Anyway, you continue, Chris, because you had a beautiful um, the way well, that you well, described it. You know, the the, 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 the yeah. restaurant at the, at the top. Oh right, yeah. When, was, when I when I first moved back up to from London back up the northeast, it was just about to be demolished. So I'd taken a lot of photographs, and and one of them. It was on the single sleeve for uh, the, when we did the acoustic version in Not So Manic Now for the anniversary uh, a little while ago. Um, but yeah, I, I, I used to work at the um, the Tesco, that which is which was at the, near the footprint of that. Um, it was a Saturday job I had when I was sixteen. Uh, do it on the biscuit dial, doing you know putting the biscuits out. And um, and I, I what? what? <laughs> um, no, it was, a, it was a good gig. It was uh, just was it just the biscuits? There was no more. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, yeah. That. I was yeah. I was I was the biscuit guy. I mean, no, no. Make sure they're not crushed. I had to be face <laughs> face down properly at the end of the day. I had to go down to the warehouse. I was in the the cage lift, which was terrifying. Down at the warehouse, it, those things were heavy when they were in. Anyway, so but at the end of the day, at the end of the night. I would come out um, at the bottom of that building and look up, up at it, and then I would get the bus passed to go home uh, and get to, to where I lived. But the thing about the uh, the building is, if you look at the little, the sort, there's like a capsule pod on the top of it, mm. um, which was it was it was created because it was supposed to be like a, you know, like a commercial unit. It was going to be either a, a restaurant or a nightclub, but from from the day it was. <laughs> Well, from the time it was built until it was destroyed for decades, it was nobody ever actually invested in it. Nobody ever did that. So it used to sort of hang like it was suspended over the in the sky above Gateshead, like an unrealized dream, you know. And it, there was just something very romantic and and moving about that. I always thought it was just you know because it was like this this idea which never came to fruition. It just mm. sort of hung there in the sky above the town, and so. They would anyway. It it just it was one of those things that sort of gets you dreaming and thinking. So, and also when the when when the building had gone, you know, it, it, um, it, it, you keep you feel kind of a strange morning for something like that when it's been part of your landscape when you're young. So I like the way that on our sleeve, uh, Dom, who does our visual stuff with us, it was really great. He he managed to get the blueprints of the building, and he sort of rendered it in a way where we could move around it and. 3D, but also it looks it it. We thought about making it look like it was concrete again and bringing it back to life, but it actually looks like it's a ghost of a building. It's kind of mm. pale and it's on a, a sort of an empty, dark landscape. So it, you kind of imagine that it's where buildings go when they die, mm. you know. So, so that so that was the way I thought about. That. You know, that's how I like to picture that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, you very. I, I, I have a slight fascination with brutalist architecture, and um, uh, there's. I think you captured very well. Maybe that's what it is. It's like the unrealized, mm. the unrealized dreams of some of those buildings are. Yeah, uh, yeah, mm. they're very. Um, I it's, think it's really sad that they're blamed for so many social problems as well. It's like it's mm -hmm. not the builder's fault, you know. <laughs> but the, the thing is, as well, Chris didn't say, but he stood next to Owen Luder, who was the architect, as the building was destroyed. And also, oh, yeah. oh, wow. Owen, Owen Luder actually died on the 25th anniversary of Disgraceful being released. Mm. So oh, it's wow. things are all. <laughs> the universe wow. moves in unusual ways, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 Uh, we we are nearly at time. I th I'd love just to ask you on what next. I think you've you've given us a good answer on what what ne might be next live. Um, uh, but what's what's next re recording wise, and, and what uh, what do you want to do with with Dubstar next? I don't know. I think, I think I think we need that cup of tea, don't we, Chris? Oh, the cup of tea. We, we, we do. I mean, I, you know. I'm, we, I, it's funny because I just, I just started a new <laughs> new song because um, I you know you you're constantly thinking about music but you just don't know necessarily if you're going to actually want to do a commercial project with it you know because that's a huge undertaking you kind of really need to pull together as people and say okay we're going to do this because it's not it's not that plain sailing you know so um, yeah we have, but we for sure I'm dying to talk to Sarah about what she's in the mood to do and uh, if you know. Or if she just feels like spending the rest of the year thinking about how great we are. <laughs> Didn't we do a great <laughs> album there? Because <laughs> that's fine. Yeah, I could do that. It's a lot of work to put an album out. You've got to enjoy it. It's, uh, <laughs> I have one more question. Um, what 
advice would you impart with a lot of um, emerging artists or artists who are trying to follow in your footsteps today? Oh, God. <laughs> I wouldn't oh, know. Boy. That's really I mean, tough. The, I mean, the thing is, it's just it's just so different now to 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 how it how it was when when we started. It's it's just. I tell you what I would say, I would say um, make sure that you don't compromise from the start. Um, yeah, I was going to say something quite similar, like be true to yeah. yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, which might sound like a cliche, but mo all of the regrets that I've had now, um, all these years on. Or about things where I, I I didn't go with my gut, and I thought I'm not sure about this, but I'm going to go yeah. with it. And then, and then, do you know what I mean? And then I, you you look back and you think, you know, it still bugs you, you know, like decades later sometimes. So I I would just say, don't compromise, but right from the start, go with your guts. Um, That's wonderful. Because they're usually yeah. right. That's awesome. Yeah, I think it takes a lot of courage as well to do that. But yes. Yeah, which is a hard thing to, to have when you're young, you know, that's the thing. Mm. Um, it's Especially if you find yourself doing something for the first time, it's it's hard to have guts. But um, but if you believe in what you're doing, you have the courage of your convictions, then just feel the fear and do it anyway. <laughs> Sorry, I've got a cliche a minute at the minute, but it's funny. <laughs> but it's, but it, does, it, it, does, it is moving though. It does make you emotional when you think about, you know, young people starting on that road and um and like your young self and things it is it's it's quite an emotional thing to contemplate mm. uh, with hindsight all right well amazing to have you on absinthe thank you so much some super insightful stuff uh and, and thanks so much for spending the time with us uh good good luck with the cup of tea um, <laughs> thanks. We're, we're all we're all counting on you uh, <laughs> um but yeah thank you thank you so much for spending time with us it's uh, it's been great thank you it's so been much. really nice yeah, it's been lovely. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Chi, for joining us yeah. tonight. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for having me again. All right. And with that, we are going to look at stars. Oh. Good night, guys. My face.